Charles Gardner, medical officer of health with the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit, here to provide you with the COVID-19 update for Simcoe Muskoka. So since I last reported on Tuesday, May the 18th, we've had an additional 305 cases. That's over an eight-day period, taking us up to 11,751 cases. This um, week increase that we had from May the 16th to the 22nd of 302 cases is down by 12% compared with uh, the number of cases that we had the week before that. Uh, compared with the province, which actually decreased by 21% over the same period of time. Um, we've uh, had a steady decline in cases week on week since the uh, week of April the 11th, when we had a peak in uh, 717 cases during that week. So we continue moving in the right direction. Um, at this point in time, we have 541 active cases. This is down from 767 last week. Uh, we've now had a total of 245 people who've passed away from COVID-19 in Simcoe, Muskoka. And so this is an additional four people over the last week. And I would like to express my condolences to the family members of those people for your loss. Um, they are uh, the following individuals, a man between the ages of 45 and 64 from Simcoe County, a woman between the ages of 65 and 79 from Simcoe County, a man between the ages of 65 and 79 from Simcoe County, and a man between the ages of 45 and 64 from the District of Muskoka. Um, none of these individuals had been immunized against COVID-19. Currently, we have 23 people from Simcoe, Muskoka, who are hospitalized, and this is down from 28 uh, last week. Uh, this includes nine people in the intensive care unit, down from 11 last week. Uh, so um, this is a downward trend, just like the downward trend that we've had in cases, a downward trend in uh, those that are actively hospitalized, which uh, peaked. Uh, during the week of April the 22nd with 66 people at that time. Uh, those in hospital range from in their 30s to their 90s. Um, 18 of these um, were uh, sporadic cases from the community and five were related to outbreaks. Um, 12 of these people are under the age of 60, so 12 of the 23. One individual in their 30s, um, six individuals in their 40s, and four of the six are being treated in the intensive care unit. Four are in their 40s, one of those being treated in the intensive care unit. Seven are in their 60s, and four of those seven are being treated in the intensive care unit. And we have four individuals who are in their 70s, none in the intensive care unit. Um, over the long weekend, we had 146 additional cases, averaging 37 cases per day. And in the last uh, 24 hours, we've had 29 cases. So they include 28 sporadic cases and one uh, as part of a workplace outbreak. 16 are male, 13 are female. Um, over 50% of these are under the age of 35. 29 are from Simcoe County, none are from Muskoka. Uh, one acquired their infection in the community, which means we, we're not sure how they got their infection. 12 uh, uh, became infected from close contact with a known individual. Uh, one was part of a workplace outbreak and 15 are under investigation. Uh, 27 of them are self-isolating and, and two of them are hospitalized. Um, uh, for the uh, week of May the 16th to the 22nd, 51% of our cases uh, were uh, reported to be from household contacts as the most likely means for their um, Acquisition, 14% were due to contact with a close friend or an associate, and 12% were uh, reported uh, to be contacts in the workplace environment. 
And this has been uh, reflective of the trend that we've seen in May. So uh, household contacts, contacts with social uh, contacts and um, uh, contact in the work environment have been key for transmission. The vast majority of our cases are reside in South Simcoe and in Barrie. So Barrie, Bradford, West Willenbury, New, New Tecumseh and Innisfil, which has been the case throughout the pandemic. Uh, for the first time in nearly three months, uh, Bradford, West Willenbury no longer has the highest incidence uh, per 100,000 population per week. So they are down to three, sorry, 103 cases per 100,000 population per week. Um, and therefore, um, there are other municipalities that have a higher incidence. Uh, New Tecumseh has slightly higher incidence of 104 cases per 100,000 population per week, which is unchanged from last week. Barry is down to 55 cases per 100,000 population per week uh, from 80 cases per 100,000 population per week a week ago. Uh, so this is a substantial decline for Barry, a 31% uh, uh, reduction. And uh, we note that um, uh, immunization continues in these communities, which is, uh, I am sure, a contributing factor to their success. Um, the incidence of cases per 100,000 population per week for all of Simcoe Muskoka is 50, uh, which is down from 57 a week ago. Um, and this remains below the provincial rate at 86 cases per 100,000 population per week. So for most of the pandemic, we've been riding at about half of the provincial rate, but a little bit higher than half of the provincial rate right now. The province had come down a little more steeply uh, over the past week compared with Simcoe Muskoka. 96% of our COVID cases uh, in the past week um, are variants of concern. So as I had indicated now, the variants of concern have essentially taken over uh, our COVID cases and have done so for several weeks. Um, the great majority of these are um, B117 variants. However, we have an increasing number that are due to the P1 uh, variant of concern, 105 cases to date up from 87 a week ago. And um, no change in uh, the number that are the B1351 variant at 19 cases and no change in the B1617 variant uh, at two cases. Uh, we presently have 10 outbreaks from COVID-19 down from 12 a week ago. Um, nine of these are due to variants of concern. Two are in institutional settings. So this is up from one a week ago. This is due to a new outbreak in uh, Creedon Valley long-term care facility. We have um, one uh, outbreak in a congregate setting, which is an increase of one from last week. Uh, and this is um, in a facility, a congregate setting in Simcoe County. We have a, um, a total of seven workplace outbreaks, which is down from 10 a week ago. So uh, we have three new outbreaks, a construction site in Simcoe County, a manufacturing site in Simcoe County, and a uh, retail trade location in Simcoe County. But we have six outbreaks in workplaces that were declared over in the past week. So three were in uh, public administrative offices in Simcoe County, two, um, two were in uh, repair and maintenance locations, and one in a retail uh, trade location, um, all of them in Simcoe County. We have no outbreaks in uh, community settings and no outbreaks in educational settings down from one uh, a week ago with a, an outbreak that had been in a child care center in Simcoe County declared over. Uh, we continue with uh, immunization, making good progress. So to date, we have administered uh, to 287,600 vaccine doses. Um, and uh, 
48% of um, our uh, population, 48% of our population has received at least one dose of immunization, and 59% of our adult population in Simcoe Muskoka, that's 18 and over, have received at least one immunization. Uh, and 79% um, of those 50 years of age and older have received at least one immunization in Simcoe Muskoka. So uh, making good progress all around, and in particular for those that are older and at higher risk, uh, certainly making very good progress for those that are 80 and above at 93.7% having had their first dose of immunization. Uh, Bradford West Willenberry has been our designated hotspot for immunizations as dictated by the province. And uh, just under 50% of their population, 49.6% of their population has been immunized compared with 48% of the rest of Simcoe Muskoka. So they have surpassed uh, vaccination in Simcoe Muskoka. So 59% of those 18 and above have had at least one dose. Um, and, uh, and that would be in Bradford, West Glowenberry, and 17% um, of uh, uh, those that are 12 to 17 have received their first dose there. So uh, good progress is being made in, in the hot spot. And that may uh, have contributed to the fact that they've had such a dramatic decline in transmission in their community and now are not the leading uh, municipality with regards to their rate of transmission over the past week. In terms of our dashboard, uh, this is a dashboard that we created for ourselves. Uh, we remain in yellow status. This is because uh, virus spread and containment re remains in yellow status. Um, and laboratory testing remains in yellow status. We do have a very good turnaround time for laboratory testing, uh, meeting the goals of 60% return in one day or 80% within two days. However, um, we still have an elevated percent positivity at 4.4%, uh, down from 5%. Uh, percent and below the provincial rate, uh, but above uh, three percent, which uh, is uh, anything about three percent, is of concern. Uh, the healthcare capacity in our district is at yellow status, uh, with uh, a, a low acute uh, acute bed occupancy uh, below uh, ninety percent, and here it's seventy five point six percent. But uh, what we consider to be yellow status for ICU bed occupancy at 90.9% and uh, high ventil uh, ventilator bed occupancy at 77.8%. And the public health system capacity remains at yellow. Uh, we um, are um, reaching 90.1% uh, of our cases um, within uh, the, the target 90%, um, but uh, need to improve with regards to um, uh, uh, getting fully back up to speed with uh, contacting all of our, our contacts of our cases. Uh, so progress is being made, uh, but we still remain in yellow status. Um, testing uh, has declined across the province in terms of rate and has also declined somewhat in Simca Muskoka. Um, and this may be in part due to a reduction in transmission, but we still have a, a fairly high percent positivity, which indicates that it would be preferable to have more testing happening, more individuals who are contacts of cases or have symptoms coming forward for testing. Um, so I'd indicated that our percent positive, positivity is 4.4%, uh, and the provinces is 6.4%, down from 7.2% a week ago. So better than the province, the province coming down and ourselves coming down. Uh, we um, 
note with regards to the occupancy of our hospitals. This is different from the figure I gave before about how many of our citizens are in hospital because they could be in the hospital either in or out of Simcoe Muskoka. But looking at um, the uh, burden carried by our local hospitals for people from here and from away uh, at this point in time, we have uh, 23 patients in acute care beds and 15 uh, patients in the intensive care units in local hospitals, including 12 that are uh, being ventilated. And um, so that makes a total of uh, 38 individuals being cared for in our hospitals in Simcoe, Muskoka. And um, 12 of these individuals are actually from uh, from our residents, the others are from out of district. So a total of 20, 26 individuals that are from out of, out of jurisdiction being provided care here. Okay. So uh, a few things with regards to immunization and the eligibility for immunization. As of May the 23rd, eligibility has been extended to include 12 and above. So those 12 and 17 uh, were new to be included to receive uh, a booking for immunization. Uh, and in fact, um, we have to date provided um, just over 2,000 individuals between the ages of 12 and 17, their immunization. So 2040 to be precise. And we have an additional 9,000 uh, individuals, youth of that age range that are booked over the next three weeks to receive their immunization. Uh, we of course are um, putting aside time in our clinics, uh, the weeks of June the 14th and the 21st, specifically to uh, immunize uh, remaining youth and their adult family members um, in keeping with uh, provincial direction. Uh, so that remains um, an option for young people. And I would certainly encourage all people who are eligible to book and receive the immunization. We've had excellent uptake. This certainly bodes well for us. Uh, if it continues uh, for us to be able to achieve herd immunity and to protect our district from um, COVID-19 in the future to stabilize and uh, avoid uh, hopefully a fourth wave. Uh, at some point in the future. Uh, it, that kind of coverage is absolutely critical. So really happy to see that there's that degree of interest among uh, young people and among uh, other people as well of different ages. Uh, and um, it's also important for young people to know that they are able to uh, book through the provincial system uh, for our clinics, but also would be able to attend uh, pharmacies that provide the Pfizer vaccine. And on the ministry's uh, Ministry of Health Provincial website, you will find a listing of those pharmacies, including for Simcoe Muskoka. Uh, and um, also young people who live or work within Bradford, West Willenbury, basically people 12 and above, I should say, would be able to book in uh, the hotspot clinics that we have been running for that community. And they would be able to do so via a booking system on the um, town of Bradford West Willenberry's website. Um, I would like to acknowledge that we've been working with our school boards in preparation for uh, the youth uh, and their adult family clinics coming up June 14th to 21st. And uh, there'll be more information about this uh, coming up in the future. Um, it's also important for people to know that everybody uh, participating in immunization needs to provide what we call informed consent. So we provide information uh, about um, the vaccines and the rationale and the importance of immunization, the potential side effects or adverse events that can occur from the immunization. Uh, and uh, that therefore they would be uh, providing us with informed consent before they get immunized. And this also holds true for youth, for those between the ages of 12 and 17. We encourage young people to um, discuss with their guardians, with their parents, um, 
this decision that they are going to make. Uh, but in the end, this is um, their decision to make, which we will respect. Um, with regards to AstraZeneca vaccine and the provision of second doses, um, the province is moving ahead with uh, the provision of second doses for AstraZeneca uh, at 12 weeks. Um, and also uh, for a time limited, uh, in time limited way, uh, for those who were immunized during the week of March 10th to the 19th with AstraZeneca, they would be able to receive their second dose uh, 10 or 11 weeks um, uh, after, after that time. Uh, and uh, the reason for that is that it's safe and effective, but also because there is a small quantity of vaccine in the province that would be expiring at the end of this month. And um, in order to avoid uh, wasting that vaccine, the province has dictated that we will be making uh, this vaccine available for that particular group at this time, should they wish it. We have had, um, this, this vaccine is actually provided uh, through family physician offices, the primary care um, offices uh, that were participating um, at that time, uh, back in March. Uh, we were uh, one of um, a number of health units, uh, six health units that were participating in a pilot for primary care to provide AstraZeneca. And so uh, really it dates back to that period of time. Uh, and um, we have provided those practitioners with vaccine to be able to carry that out. And um, they will be contacting their patients in order to book and follow up with them. So we're asking that people not contact them, that in fact, they'll reach out to uh, the patients in question. Um, also, uh, I mentioned that um, going forward in time, uh, those who've received AstraZeneca at a later date uh, would be able to um, receive AstraZeneca vaccine at or after 12 weeks. And um, there are pharmacies here that would be participating in this as well as primary care practitioners. And so um, I would advise that people reach out to the pharmacies to look into this. Primary care, I anticipate that they would be reaching out to their patients in order to, uh, to make this arrangement, to make this offer to them. Uh, the province is also gonna be providing guidance in the near future, uh, possibly in June, uh, with regards to the potential for those who've received AstraZeneca to receive uh, another vaccine instead, um, such as uh, Pfizer or possibly Moderna vaccine, they will be waiting for guidance from um, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization on uh, the potential to do this. So this may be another option for those who've received AstraZeneca uh, vaccine, um, that they would be able to, to go that route instead for their second dose. Um, we continue with our uh, community immunization clinics, and um, we have some pop-up clinics that are happening as well. One of them uh, is taking place on Monday, May the 31st from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, for the residents of the township of Lake of Bays. And um, this would be those that are 18 years of age or older who live, work, or go to school anywhere in the district of Muskoka, um, and in order to register, uh, they should uh, um, do so by contacting the township through their website, or they can contact uh, the health unit in order to register for this at 705-721-7520, extension 5997. Um, so there are many options for people to receive immunization. People can continue to book into our mass vaccination clinics, and that's for those that are 12 and above, uh, and they can do so on the provincial booking system or via the provincial vaccine booking line, both of which is on our website. Um, those uh, who have already booked and are waiting to be immunized, uh, can put themselves on the standby list 
to be called back at the end of the day for clinics if there's any leftover vaccine. This, is, this list is uh, established afresh each day at eight in the morning. And so they can certainly contact us as a health unit in order to, uh, to be put onto that list if they want a, a chance of being immunized sooner. Uh, for those that are um, uh, 12 and above that either live or work or go to school in um, the town of Bradford, West Quillenberry, a hotspot, they can book uh, to attend one of our hotspot clinics there uh, via the townships, the town's website. We have pharmacies in Simcoe, Muskoka that are providing either Pfizer or Moderna vaccine. And um, we would advise that people have a look at the province's website about which pharmacies provide which of these vaccines um, and that you contact these pharmacies in order to, uh, to arrange a booking. Uh, they aren't participating in the provincial booking system. Uh, and um, we have a pilot underway for Moderna vaccine. This is uh, primary care practitioners providing Moderna vaccine and um, uh, this would, uh, be for, for, would be for the adult population. And um, the participating family practices would be reaching out to their patients in order to make this offer. So I, I request that you not contact them, they'll contact their patients. Um, and uh, just a reminder that um, we recommend that um, people uh, um, diligently pursue immunization um, and um, take the first opportunity that you can to receive immunization. Uh, the booking system may be delayed uh, for our mass immunization clinics because of the large numbers of groups now that are uh, eligible to receive immunization. So it may be uh, later in June that you're getting your booking. Um, the province um, issued its uh, provincial roadmap last Thursday for reopening. And um, according to uh, their own announcement, they anticipate that they would be entering step one of the roadmap during the week of June the 14th. They do have criteria for uh, moving through their three-step roadmap. Uh, the criteria include achieving certain levels of immunization um, that they uh, provided publicly, but uh, also include other criteria that um, they didn't uh, actually indicate um, the levels that would, would be needed to be achieved in order to move into those stages. But they do uh, speak to uh, transmission levels and burden on, on the healthcare system as uh, being um, part of uh, what would determine whether or not you can move into the next stage. And they also indicated that uh, there'd be a minimum of uh, 21 days between each step. Uh, they also indicated um, last week uh, that uh, starting on Saturday, the uh, number of outdoor amenities uh, would be open for public use. And uh, they were very specific indicating golf courses and driving ranges, golf, uh, soccer and sports fields, tennis and basketball courts, uh, skate parks. Um, there are certain other uh, amenities as well that are listed provincially and please have a look at our website for the details on that. Um, but the stay-at-home order remains. So the province has increased um, the gathering size allowed outdoors to five individuals. Uh, and it can be people who are not from the same household, but if if not from the same household, physical distancing of two meters uh, or use of masks, if you cannot, uh, you find yourself in a situation where you cannot distance uh, is necessary. Um, and for indoors, we are still to stay to household members only in our homes, not have other people over and not go over to other people's homes indoors uh, with the exception of individuals who live alone who can identify one other household to have that kind of close contact with. Um, but um, with all of that in mind, uh, being allowed to have uh, outdoor gatherings of up to five people with the distancing, uh, I think that that would en better enable people to take advantage of these outdoor amenities. 
Um, and it's also important to note that any indoor environments that are associated with those outdoor amenities remain closed, such as clubhouses. Um, and um, also people need to be very careful about uh, avoiding carpooling with individuals that aren't from your household, um, because that essentially is uh, a close uh, uh, environment exposure, a high risk exposure. Um, and um, uh, also it's important for people to be aware that um, they are to stay close to home, to not to travel, uh, except for essential purposes. Uh, for that matter, not to leave your home except for essential purposes, one of which is physical activity, which is important for people's mental and physical well-being, uh, and hence the outdoor amenities that people are now able to use. Um, but uh, certain other, other activities such as shopping or seeking medical attention, but otherwise the stay-at-home order remains and um, it's important that people abide by that. So some media questions that we've received are as follows. Dr. David Williams said yesterday that every medical officer of health in the province agrees that schools should reopen before the end of the year. What is your position on school openings? And I agree that uh, speaking for Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit, I, for myself as medical officer of health, that we support returning to school at this time. Um, we, um, believe that our rates are down sufficiently that we can uh, follow up with cases and their contacts and would be able to do so for any exposures in schools uh, to be able to uh, enable action required in response to an exposure in a school. Uh, and we noted that all the way through the pandemic, um, there, there's been a very limited amount of transmission in schools, many more exposures happening in schools versus transmissions in schools. The exposures are from cases that have occurred out of schools elsewhere in the community or in the home, um, and that the control measures that are in, uh, in place for schools uh, you know, are effective, and we would uh, certainly require that they continue. But we feel ready, and we feel that it's important to, be, uh, to have children be able to return to school. Um, and we have a limited amount of time left in the school year, but that limited amount of time would be very, very beneficial for their, their physical and mental well-being and for their education and for supporting families with regards to being able to attend uh, and participate in uh, essential work at this time. Um, okay, at this point, I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Gardner. As always, we encourage one question and one follow-up to ensure that all have the option to participate this afternoon. Um, can we start with Erica Engel from Collingwood today? Do you have a question for Dr. Gardner? Yes, um, good afternoon. Um, I noticed that this week hospitals are restarting non-emergency procedures. Um, and they've indicated there are hundreds of delayed procedures that they're um, going to have to catch up on over the next however long. Um, as rates declined and, and with possible end in sight, how much has the health unit turned its mind to recovery and mm -hmm. what will the priorities be there? Well, that's a very good question. That's a very big question because certainly recovery as a term can be applied to the healthcare system. It certainly would need to be applied to the public health system. Uh, it could be applied to the whole of society, the economy. Um, but it, my understanding about hospitals is it's going to take them maybe over, like over a year uh, to catch up with the tremendous number of surgical procedures that have been put on hold because of the pandemic. Um, and even now, I think that they may be limited in how much of that they can do uh, because the, the ICUs still have a high occupancy on the whole for the province. And they do need some ICU capacity for their um, uh, uh, care post-surgically uh, for higher risk procedures or individuals that uh, um, are uh, at a higher risk of complications. So. Uh, it's going to take a very long time. I would say um, I have been able to be part of some of those sorts of discussions because I 
am sitting on um, the response and recovery table for the central region of Ontario Health. So I, I hear of these things from um, leadership in, in hospitals. Uh, for us in public health, we don't have a direct hand in that. Our role um, has is always the prevention of disease and keeping people out of the hospital in the first place. So that's, of course, a critical role uh, all through the pandemic and at this time. It, it, um, it will be absolutely essential to avoid a fourth wave, to continue to bring the third wave completely under control and maintain it under control for that recovery to take place. And uh, I, I would also say that in, in public health, as I've noted, we to have our recovery that we need to go through. And um, it'll be hard for us to begin that recovery now. We're still very busy in full swing with immunization and will be through the summer and into the early fall. And um, we still have a significant amount of case and contact management. And we still have to do a lot of advising to um, the business community and to the general public about the restrictions and the changes in restrictions as we go through um, the, the province's road, roadmap, the easing of restrictions, we, we, we need to be there to continue to advise on all of that and when necessary to enforce. So it's going to be a while before we can turn our minds, our attention and our resources to um, getting back to our full complement of uh, public health programming and easing out of all that we've had to do with the pandemic. Um, just in follow up to that, have has um, have school kids then missed another round of vaccines? I know last year you had to do catch up for like the grade sevens mm -hmm. or something like that. Was there another That's one right. now missed in the in the spring again lost, and we we will essentially have to do a couple of year of cohort vaccination in the fall in order to catch up. And that's merely one of our programs. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Brett Glover from Barry 360, do you have a question today? Yes, I do. Thanks very much for taking my questions, Dr. Gardner. Uh, the last time the province announced its reopening plan, you stressed the need for caution, considering the variant emerging in Barrie at the time. Now, you've already discussed the particulars of the plan announced last week, but I wanted to get your opinion of it, especially in regards to how it ties to the to ties reopening to vaccination rates. Um, you know, I, I've commented uh, on Friday that I think that they have a suitably cautious plan with a um, an appropriate timeline. Uh, I, I uh, thought it was appropriate to keep us in shutdown for now. Um, I thought we were safe to be, and I still do think we're safe to be able to open up the amenities that have been identified, but with the proviso that the indoor environments associated with them remain closed, that the gathering rem uh, limits remain low at five, that all the other requirements of distancing and masking are in place. Um, I um, uh, think it's good that we're waiting and they've cited the week of the 14th of June before you get into the first step, that that first step is an opening up of outdoor amenities and businesses, not indoors, um, that there's 21 days between each step. Um, 28 would have been uh, two full incubation periods, so it would have been that much more cautious, but 21 is cautious. Uh, that you're really not getting into large scale indoor environments to step three. I do note that step two allows for um, a, a retail environments to be opened, very diminished um, occupancy at 15%, but open. That's, that is an indoor environment, so we'd have to be careful about that in, in, uh, in step two. But I do think it's very good that it's linked to immunization rates because it's immunization that's really going to be the foundation for us going forward and keeping the pandemic controlled. And it is uh, something that's been shown to be very beneficial in, in uh, achieving control in uh, the experience of other countries and in particular in Israel. 
Uh, so we, um, I support uh, the, the plan as a whole. I think it's important that they use the other indicators um, uh, when considering uh, the safety of opening up. Uh, they, they've specified in very broad terms what they are, but not what the actual trigger points are. So it's important that they do indeed take into account the level of transmission and the burden on the healthcare system, ICU occupancy. Uh, when uh, deciding uh, whether they can move to the next stages. Um, and, you know, the capacity of the public health system is something that should be considered as well, our own readiness uh, to be able to move through the stages. Uh, considering the plan that was announced last week, combined with all the downward trends that we've seen lately, how real is the risk of a fourth wave, do you think? We're doing very well for immunization, and that bodes really well for us. We're not finished yet. We um, need possibly to get as high as an 89% coverage. That's the high end estimate that Public Health Ontario has released. Uh, and that certainly implies that you're going to be immunizing children. We are now immunizing youth. It's quite possible that uh, there'd be recommendations in the fall for children. We'll have to wait and see. I know that the research is underway looking at uh, immunization for children. Um, but um, I, th I think that it's uh, critically important um, that we achieve high immunization in order to make it much more likely that um, we either don't have a fourth wave at all uh, or that it be very diminished compared with what we've experienced to date. Thank you for your time. My pleasure. Mary Beth Hartle from Muskoka Region. <laughs> Do you have a question today? You know what? No, I don't. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, James Bowler from Kojiko, do you have a question today? I do. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gardner, just wanted to ask you about the province's announcement of, of the uh, staged reopening. Uh, again, it's, they're saying the 14th, but the stay at home order was expected to end on the second. So there's a 12 day gap in there that really hasn't been addressed at this point. Mm -hmm. um, what do you make of that? Do you suspect they're just going to extend the stay at home order to the 14th at this point? It's a very good question. I really don't know. It implies either that it's extended or that in fact, they uh, move to that first step sooner. I think that um, you need to be really cautious about this. I, I don't think we should be rushing to uh, to that first step. Um, and uh, I think that we really need, the province needs to look very closely at the, um, the health indicators that are part of this plan uh, to guide that decision. And just in regards to the, the provincial focus of this rather than health units, do you think it's fair to do a, a province-wide scope on this stage plan? Uh, there are so many regions that are in majorly different areas of infection rates and vaccination mm -hmm. rates. Should it not be a more of a health unit focus again? So unfortunately, when we had that health unit framework on in two spans of time, the fall, and then again, uh, just before getting into the third wave, it proved to be ineffective that um, people moved from areas that were locked down or shut down into areas that were more open in order to take advantage of their amenities and their services. And by doing that, they transmitted COVID-19 into those areas and uh, helped to spread COVID-19 across the province. So we didn't have a success as an experience with that framework. I, I don't think we should be uh, using a framework like that again. Where we did see success was coming out of wave one when we had a step approach to reopening for the province as a whole. And so I think what we're seeing is reverting back to what we had success with, with that kind of approach. I do acknowledge that some areas are gonna be can, you, know, you could consider them ready sooner than other areas, but if we went with the, with the colored framework approach by opening them up sooner, you'd have people going there from the, um, the shutdown areas and transmitting in those areas. So on the whole, I, would, I, I support the approach we're taking now, which succeeded where the other approach did not. Thank you. 
You're welcome. Mike Arcelides from CTV Barry, do you have a question today? Yes, thank you. Doctor, hello. Hello. What's concerning you right now? Uh, you go to the waterfront and you see uh, hundreds of people out there. Uh, you, you see an excitement in the community. What uh, is your message to residents right now? Is it time to just let loose and have fun? Or should we, you know, be a little scared right now that we could potentially see something or are rates really low right now? I would say it's important for people to realize that although we're having success in bringing down transmission, we're still having in the range of a thousand cases in the province a day. Uh, and that is actually the level that we had when we came out of uh, the shutdown at the end of stage of uh, the second wave. And unfortunately that set the stage for us to then end up in the third wave. So um, I think one could raise the point, we now have immunization and that brings us into a different situation. And we also have warmer outdoor weather and that brings us into a different situation that's safer. And I would acknowledge that, um, but uh, I, I still think that it's premature for us to uh, disregard the, um, the requirements that are in place now. I, I encourage people to, uh, go outside carefully, to do so uh, abiding by the gathering limits of no more than five people of keeping physical distance from non-household members, um, to uh, certainly take care of your well-being that way and your mental health that way, and to seek and get immunized as soon as you can. Um, I, 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 um, I think, though, that we need to be cautious uh, and take it one step at a time. So do you anticipate we'll see an increase? I know some of your colleagues we've spoken to have said we could see uh, a little bit of a spike here, a little blip uh, following the long mm -hmm. weekend. Is there any indication that that is the case and we had evidence of gatherings? Uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw something of a rise. You're not going to see it for another two weeks. There's that lag in the data before people uh, develop symptoms get tested and uh, we get the data. Um, so of course we will be looking for that. We're looking for it for Mother's Day. And so we're, if that's gonna happen, we'll see it in this week's data. Um, so uh, there's always a potential with these holiday weekends that um, there are some gatherings despite our advice and despite the requirements. Um, and uh, we typically will see it in the data. So indeed we'll be looking for it. When do you think we'll open the schools here locally? Well, that is a provincial decision. I would say that I would welcome it and welcome it even now, um, as I'd already indicated earlier today in my report. Um, but ultimately, it's, it rests with the province. I know that the chief MOH has advocated for it. I know that my colleagues are advocating for it. Thank you. You're welcome. Mark Claremont from Muskoka Today. Do you have a question for Dr. Gardner? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, what do you make of the test numbers being down, Dr. Gardner? It's a good question. Uh, as I'd indicated, I would prefer that they be up a bit at least because we still have a high percent positivity. That percent positivity is really a, an indicator of how much transmission is happening versus how much testing is happening. And it goes up when you've got both um, more transmission happening and not enough testing happening. So it's improving, it's coming down, but it's still fairly high. Um, I, I, I think numbers are, of tests are probably coming down because there's a reduction in transmission and fewer people are getting sick. But I, would, I also think that um, there are some people who should be getting tested who aren't getting tested. People who've had contact with a case who should be getting tested, people who have symptoms who should be getting tested. And I certainly very much encourage people uh, who fall into that category of, to get tested. And in fact, um, a, it would be in keeping with a order that I issued under the Health Protection and Promotion Act some months ago that they'd be required to isolate and get tested. Thanks very much. Also, my other question is, uh, you mentioned that 60%, almost 60% of the 18 plus adults in uh, Simcoe, Muskoka have uh, received at least the first vaccine. 
What do you think the uh, one dose versus two dose uh, situation is going to be this summer? And if you get to that and you're trying to achieve herd, men, herd immunity of uh, 75%, do you think, when do you think we'll get, you know, as close as we can get to 100%? Uh, good, good question. So I'm fully supportive of the province and the national strategy to delay the second dose, to enable more people to get the protection of the first dose, which is high protection, uh, sooner. And I have no doubt that that has helped bring uh, this uh, third wave under control, reduce cases, and save lives. So fully supportive of that, but I also fully support that people get their second dose when they can. And uh, as the supply of vaccine increases, if we're able to accelerate how quickly that happens, that we do so. Uh, and uh, I guess with all of that in mind, um, when I look at the math, I would be anticipating that we would get uh, the, um, the majority of people having, almost, you know, the great majority of people who are, are going to receive the immunization uh, uh, will have had their first dose uh, by the end of June or into early July, and that uh, people would be getting, everybody uh, would be getting their second dose um, by the end of September or the beginning of October. Fine, thank you very much. You're welcome. Can we go over to the phone line today? Are there any questions? Hi there, it's uh, Adrian from MyFam. Uh, yeah, I have a quick question. I, I was just wondering if you still are finding that um, you're running into the vaccine hesitancy? We you know, we're having excellent uptake of the vaccine. We um, are having excellent uptake in particular for older people. So, uh, you know, over 90% of people in uh, 80 plus have received this vaccine. That's uh, wonderful, an amazing level of coverage that, uh, you know, people, the great majority of people who are about 50 have received the vaccine. Uh, most of our territory has received the vaccine. We've had some uh, municipalities that lagged uh, for coverage and uh, that I think was related to um, opportunities for them to receive vaccines. So we followed up by promoting it or increasing uh, transportation supports or by providing pop-up clinics in those communities. And so we've been able to uh, get coverage improved in those communities that way. Our hotspot community, Bradford, West Willenberry has responded very, very well to um, augmented opportunities for immunization uh, so that they've overtaken and now surpassed Simcoe Muskoka as a whole for coverage. Um, and uh, I, I have um, a high degree of optimism that uh, we're gonna achieve a high rate of coverage overall. And youth now have shown a robust interest. Those 12 to 17 have shown a robust interest in getting immunized. So it's a little early for us to be able to say what groups would not be responding in that way, who need additional special attention. Um, and uh, indeed, we are doing that analysis. We plan to have a campaign to address vaccine hesitancy late, later in June uh, and uh, to identify groups that need additional supports and help and identify how we can um, help them to overcome the hesitancy and identify whether or not it's truly hesitancy or just reduced opportunity for them that they have uh, physical barriers to accessing it rather than um, an aversion to receiving immunization. So, so far we're having a really good response uh, and we have work to do to identify uh, what groups um, you know, will, will need additional help from us. Do you, just a, a quick follow-up, do you find um, any of uh, the people who received the AstraZeneca vaccine uh, as their initial dose, um, I guess maybe they're in a group that um, are maybe hesitant to get a second shot or um, are one of the 
the groups that are doing the so-called uh, vaccine shopping, where they're looking well, so far, for and where they, they don't have to get that? Um, the opportunity that they have right now is to receive AstraZeneca at um, 12 weeks. And for those that receive their first dose the week, the, week, the time interval of uh, March the 10th to the 19th would be able to receive a vaccine at 10 or 11 weeks right now. Um, and we've been able to distribute all of the vaccine that we have for AstraZeneca that would cover that group um, to our primary care providers who, who, were the, who were the ones who provided the first dose. Um, so they, were, they received it and are administering it now. And it looks like we're having a good uptake for that first group to receive, uh, receive their second dose of AstraZeneca. Um, so time will tell whether or not uh, those, uh, that group, those that received AstraZeneca for the first dose will want to receive a second dose of AstraZeneca or whether they will want to wait and see um, what might come in the way of providing another vaccine as a choice for them, one of the mRNA vaccines such as Pfizer. Um, we await advice on that, and it may be that uh, some, I'm sure that some will prefer that, but at this point we don't know the details on that because it's too soon to know. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Shane McDonald from Simcoe.com, do you have a question today? You, hey, uh, hi, Dr. Gardner. I have Hello. a question about grocery stores. Uh, recently I've noticed a few area grocery stores in Simcoe County have reported, you know, five cases of COVID among employees, um, several grocery stores over, you know, a week's time. And um, just curious, what does the health unit do uh, to ensure that those grocery stores are still safe for the public? Do those show up as outbreaks, workplace outbreaks uh, in your list? And uh, yeah, so those are my questions. So uh, we define a workplace outbreak as evidence of transmission at the site. Uh, and in order to make that determination, you need more than a single case occurring among employees. Uh, and um, that uh, when we take their history, uh, we're not able to identify that they are obtained it from another source, like in the community or from their household, uh, making it much more likely that in fact they caught it from each other at work. Uh, and uh, when, when um, in fact, uh, we have that situation, we declare an outbreak, and uh, they end up being posted in our stats on our website. We don't list the name of um, most premises, um, and the only time we would is if it would become necessary to do so to uh, advise the public because uh, we feel there's been exposure that's high risk and we can't, um, through other means, identify the, the members of the public who got exposed. But that uh, almost never occurs. It's very unusual. Um, and um, instead, for workplaces such as food establishments, uh, we um, at work with, identify everybody who's a high risk contact of the cases and have them go into isolation or quarantine and not attend work and otherwise have very close monitoring or surveillance of the work environment uh, to look for other cases and put in place uh, all the infection prevention and control requirements uh, that need to be there anyway as a requirement for uh, work environments. Um, and um, uh, as I've indicated, uh, we wouldn't be releasing the name of the facility, uh, the, the store, the, the operation, unless uh, through history taking, we'd identified that there had been high risk contacts of members of the public. Um, so uh, there have been situations where we've had work environments where there's been an exposure, but no evidence of transmission on site. And so there we have enhanced surveillance in place. Uh, to uh, make sure that no transmission occurs, that there isn't actually an outbreak going on. Um, but uh, in those situations, if in fact they don't go on to be identified as an outbreak, then they aren't included on our stats on our website. 
Although the individual cases go into our case count. And just like, uh, I guess you did kind of mention how, what you would do there, right? Contact tracing. So uh, mm -hmm. second question, um, I don't know, how would you rate the success of this stay at home order? And how do you kind of parse that with the effect on the local businesses, the patio, the restaurant mm -hmm. that haven't been open for a long time and the hairdressers, yeah. they have a long road ahead of them, right? So how do you parse the success of those two things? The stay-at-home order was absolutely essential. It was critical to put in place. Uh, before it was put in place, we were well into the most severe wave, the third wave of COVID-19 that we had in terms of cases and in terms of hospital admissions and ICU admissions uh, and impact on younger people because of the variants of concern being more communicable and more severe. Uh, and we were well on our way to our hospital system being overwhelmed and unable to cope, putting patients at risk of dying for a lack of care, essentially the inability to provide them with the intensive care unit support that they needed. Um, and we saw the results of the stay at home order and the shutdown in that uh, the, the, uh, the cases peaked in mid April and then have been coming down ever since uh, steadily uh, such that we're much lower now than we were when we were near the, the top of the peak. We were uh, almost at 5,000 cases per day in the province, and we're now at about 1,000 cases a day in the province. Um, the intensive care units are still full. There's been some reduction, but they take a long time to empty because people spend a long time in the intensive care unit. So we're still vulnerable. If we were to have another wave, we'd still be vulnerable to overwhelming um, that kind of care capacity, uh, those who are most sick would be endangered of not being able to receive uh, their care. So we need to be careful now. We need to do what we, all that we can to avoid that kind of resurgence. We're in a much better place because we've managed to vaccinate such a large proportion of the population. That helps us tremendously, but we need to take this one step at a time. Um, there is no doubt that this has been very hard on many, many businesses and it continues to be hard in many businesses because uh, they cannot open. Um, and certainly I fully acknowledge the hardship that that is for, for owners and for people who work in these places with regards to their income and endangering their livelihood. Um, but we, we really had no choice um, because what was at stake otherwise was the potential for mass mortality in hospitals with the hospital system being overwhelmed. Great, uh, thank you so much. You're welcome. Mohamed Fahim from My Muskoka Now. Do you have a question for Dr. Gardner? Yes, please. Uh, thank you, can, can you hear me well? Yes. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Doctor. So, um, uh, I'm sorry, I, I joined a bit a bit late, so you may have uh, already covered this uh, in the early minutes of this. Uh, but um, uh, when it comes to schools, so there's there's a lot of a lot of talk left. Yeah, for just from your reaction, I'm like, yeah, you, you probably did. Uh, so yeah, uh, from when it comes to schools, uh, there's a lot of talk. Um, um, there's uh, a lot of um, concerns from both sides. So there, there's kind of an urgency to bring uh, uh, in-person in learning back um, as soon as possible for the mental health of kids uh, um, because of it, it just as a, as a result of virtual learning for so long. But then there's also, um, you know, the other side is concerned that um, uh, we're putting kids at, at, at risk and also uh, we're putting the progress that we've done up till now in terms mm -hmm. of the, the fight against the spread at risk. Um, and on top of that, so the, the Minister of Education's, um, uh, Ontario's Minister of Education's stand on this is he, that he will continue to rely on expert medical advice uh, when it comes to this uh, aspect. And Dr. William, the Chief, uh, Chief Medical Officer of Health for Ontario, his position is that he's been encouraging schools to open as soon as possible. Uh, I, I believe you've, you've probably heard that yesterday. So uh, my question is, what's, what's your standing on this? Um, so I'm fully supportive of opening schools now, and uh, I did speak to this earlier, so certainly um, feel, feel free to, to look at the posting once we get it up, which will be shortly. Um, but in a nutshell, I would say that um, even when we had schools open in the earlier waves, 
transmission was actually quite limited. There were many exposures in schools because there was transmission to children in the community and in the home, but uh, it was only a small number of cases in which we had transmission happening in the schools, even though we had those exposures. And we now have uh, our case count down um, very substantially compared with at the height of the third wave and are in a better position to be able to follow up with our cases and would be able to do so in schools. And uh, the schools were able to have the success they had in preventing transmission because of all the uh, sanitation and infection prevention and control measures. Um, and now also teachers have had their first dose of immunization. So they have an added level of protection and a significant number of our youth uh, now have had immunization, although um, it, that's just taken place. So it wouldn't have fully taken uh, effect for the next uh, two weeks or so. Um, so it's possible that there would be some increase in transmission related to going back to school. The, the numbers would be very limited. And um, uh, in public health, our approach is that schools should be the very last thing to close and the very first thing to open uh, because of the importance of uh, school, uh, the school environment to children and to their mental and physical well being. Thank you. And uh, uh, as a follow-up question, or uh, I have a generally, generally second question. Um, so um, when it comes to, uh, so uh, I'm sure you know the, the Solicitor General has already mentioned that the, well, the reopening will not, um, yeah, the reopening is already out. It, it will not be uh, regional. It will be more of a, 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 a sector-based uh, reopening. Um, so here, here at this health unit, you're, you you deal with kind of like two main parts, Simcoe and Muskoka. Uh, where at Simcoe you have you do have uh, identified hotspots, and in Muskoka you're dealing with with one to two new cases a day for for about a week now. Um, so how how uh, how does not not taking a regional approach fit in this and specifically to this health unit where you have Two, two kind of sides uh, that are very clearly different in case rates, uh, but one health unit controlling all of them there. So uh, I do support the provincial wide approach because I believe that the health unit by health unit framework did not succeed twice in the pandemic, once in the fall of last year, and then again, coming out of the second wave and going into the third wave versus a, all of province approach did succeed coming out of the first wave. Uh, what happens with uh, a, a framework with health unit, uh, health unit by health unit approach is those that are more restricted um, end up with populations moving to less restricted areas in order to take advantage of their um, businesses and services. And that leads to transmission in those areas. And there's a real risk that if Simcoe uh, County were to remain uh, under shutdown, but Muskoka were to open, that you would get more people from Simcoe and south of Simcoe going to Muskoka, uh, leading to transmission in Muskoka. Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. Is there anyone who hasn't had an opportunity to ask their question today? Okay, I think that uh, concludes our media briefing. Um, next week, our media briefing will be on Tuesday, June 1st. Thank you so much, Dr. Gardner, and thank you for everyone's participation today. Hey, oh. Sorry, I just have one quick question for Dr. Gardner. What about kids under age 12? Do they uh, eventually get the vaccine? That's a good question. Your question was, what about children under 12? There is research underway for children as, as young as six months of age. Um, and uh, we shall see what the results are on that. And we shall see what the National Advisory Committee on Immunization uh, would advise about vaccinating younger children. They are at lower risk of transmission and are at lower risk of complications and severe disease. So I think the National Advisory Committee on Immunizations would have to take that into account. 
uh, with regards to their advice. But um, personally, I, 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 I feel that it would be prudent for us to be prepared and have some plans in place for the immunization of younger children uh, uh, here. It's better for us to be prepared for that. Um, I don't know when that would happen, um, but uh, progress on, on vaccine uh, development and clinical trials and approvals have happened at, at a very, very fast rate throughout the pandemic. So this could come um, sooner than you would think. Also, who knows, possibly in the fall. Thank you so much, everyone. And we will uh, resume our media briefing next week on June the 1st. So once again, thank you everyone for your participation and thank you to Dr. Gardner. Bye everybody. Bye. Thank you.